I'm going to start. Uh, we can leave the door open. People are probably going to come along as we go. Uh, well, first of all, I, um, I have to apologize. Uh, my original t title was uh, looking pretty much like this, but it was too long, so uh, I had to cut the towns out of it. Um, so, well, that's, uh, that's a minor thing, right? And um, as if that was not enough, I actually ignored one in two towns in my survey area. So, uh, but, but uh, it'll be part of my presentation now. Uh, I only mentioned Aalborg or Vibor um, is actually also uh, found uh, within my survey area, but to the very, very uh, southern edge of it. Anyway, what I'm about to present is an attempt at placing the development of um, these two late Viking Age urban centers in a broader regional and chronological perspective. The existence of Viking Age Vibor and Aalborg have been well known for long, but during the past three decades, private detectors have supplied a significant uh, new element to the archaeological record of the region. They've located a dense network of metal-rich settlements in the coastal zone. In the most well-surveyed areas, these settlements have been found at all the hills close to the fjord. And I'm convinced that uh, the development of the early towns can only be understood with reference to uh, these surrounding settlements. And during the next few minutes, I'll outline a few characteristic socioeconomic changes visible on a regional scale, changes that were probably fund of fundamental importance to the growth of Viking Age Olbor and Viking Age Vibor. This is uh, the Limfjord region. Uh, the Limfjord uh, stretches uh, 125 kilometers across northern Jutland. Today it's open at the western end, but uh, the status of this exit has shifted several times during the lifetime of the fjord, as it tends to sand up. And in addition to the western end and the eastern exit, there's, uh, there were probably also a northern exit out of the fjord uh, during the Viking Age. And it therefore offered a safe, comfortable shortcut if sailing from Kattegat to the North Sea, or Skagerrak, or vice versa. Choosing this route you could avoid the notorious, notoriously dangerous waters by the northern tip of Denmark. And the fjord was thus probably a fairly important sailing route during the Viking Age. Written sources mention royal fleets in the fjord in the 11th century and in the heart of the region, right where the three main courses of the fjord meet, Agaspor, the largest of the Danish ring fortresses, was erected in the late 10th century. About the same time, or slightly after, two major economic centers appear, Aalborg to the east and Vibor to the south. Today, both of these are covered by thriving cities, but they're well known from our written sources and excavations of small bits and pieces show that they, were probably, they probably started out as agrarian settlements, but at least by the 11th century and probably slightly earlier, both were thriving towns. Uh, if we look at the uh, archaeological record from the region, uh, it probably leaves a, a fairly good overall impression of settlement. Most of the coastal zone were densely populated during the first millennium AD. Actually, this was already the case in many areas as early as a couple of centuries BC. And these areas were also some of the most densely populated areas in Denmark in the 7th century, uh, 17th century, when we have the first national recordings of settlement. This continuity probably reflects the effect of rich and varied natural resources. The same areas have the best soil, and the fjord have always supplied a rich selection of secondary supplies. Fish bones are fairly common at most of the uh, uh, settlements in the region, that is, if preservation conditions uh, are good. It's also in the coastal areas that the metal detectors have been most successful. By far, most finds comes from a series of sites located at the hills by the fjord, or to the east and to the west, at the hills close to the sea. The metal detector finds seem to uh, be scattered in and around large settlements, and most of these appear to be large uh, agrarian settlements, uh, but some display uh, high-status features. Hall-like buildings have been excavated at three of the most 
well investigated sites. Uh, I've marked them here. Um, one of them is uh, Tofton Ness. I think uh, Matt is gonna he's gonna mention that on uh, uh, on his uh, paper and uh, he's on next. So um, um, anyway, um, the buildings are uh, um, at these three sites are very different, and the datings of them are uh, very different as well. But uh, I think these are probably just the top of uh, of the iceberg. Looking at the metal detector finds and air photos of uh, the other large settlements of the region, I think it's likely that most, if not all, were run by local magnates living in such hole like buildings. Um, the number of metal detector finds and the composition of the find record, uh, of course, vary considerably from site to site, but the finds doesn't seem to reflect the existence of a distinct settlement hierarchy. Gold and top level pieces of metalwork are extremely rare. Uh, and by far the majority of the finds are, well, of more common types. Most of the large settlements in the coastal area also seem to display an element of specialization in the form of abundant pit houses or sunken featured buildings, uh, if you like. Uh, in fact, these are uh, extremely abundant in the region. I'm not sure if uh, so many pit houses have been recorded anywhere else, and the majority of the pit houses seem to be dated between the 7th and 11th century, and many seem to have been used for textile production as they contain loom weights and spindle whorls. In addition to the pit houses that seem to grow marked in numbers during the 7th and 8th century, a high degree of specialization is also uh, indicated at two particular sites, at Sebersund in the central part of the region and at Vestavane in two to the west. The site at Sebersund was recovered by private detectors in the late 1980s and partly uh, excavated uh, afterwards. Uh, in addition to the um, remains of an early wooden church, a cemetery, and a large area uh, with about 200 pit houses, the excavators also located a workshop area with thick, thick cultural layers full of waste from different crafts. And according to the metal detector find, the site appears to be uh, to have been sporadically used from the 5th century and onwards, and during the Viking Age, activities are increasing. And in the early 12th century, centuries, uh, activities seem to cease. Unfortunately, most effort was spent excavating the early church and the cemetery, so our understanding of the full extent and character of the settlement is somewhat vague. Um, one of the things stressed by the excavators was the absence of actual longhouses, but in fact, the, they, uh, they only uncovered small areas where you're supposed to find these longhouses. At Vestavane and Tooth, the private detectives have recently discovered another atypical settlement. This has so far only been investigated during, small uh, during a small excavation campaign. But uh, this campaign revealed thick cultures layers, extremely rich, rich in fish bones. It looks as if fishing may have be played a decisive economic role at the settlement. The Vestavane site is also one of the sites which have yielded most Viking Age coins, which is fairly impressive, as uh, uh, there's uh, got to be a lot left in the cultural layer still preserved at the site. Both at Vestavane and Sebersund, um, yeah, both Vestavane and Sebersund are uh, by located by right by navigable waters. Uh, that is in opposition to most of the other settlements. These are uh, usually situated on the hills at the more optimal locations for farming. Um, and this one is, uh, is best of any and two. It seems to have been thriving from the 7th century and onwards. And one of the things uh, worth noting here is the likely predator uh, 400 meters to the south. Um, the distribution of the metal detector finds seem to indicate that the settlement was moved from here around 8600. Uh, and it appears to have been moved across a rather distinct boundary in the landscape, a small river. And um, that's the thing I'll get back to in a minute. But uh, just let's have a quick look at the uh, evidence of the trade as well. The detectives uh, have also supplied a large number of finds that gives a rough impression of early trade in the region. However, only from the 9th century and onwards, from the centuries prior to the Viking Age, we have no means of exchange and consequently very little to go on in respect of investigating the extent of trade. 
What's most striking about the coins, the hack silver, the weights, and all the imports is the scattered distribution. To judge from these actual trade, uh, these actual trade and the use of silver as payment became fairly common during the 9th and 10th century, also very much in the rural areas. Finally, I want to return to the uh, restructuring of settlement. Uh, the distinct displacement of settlement during the 7th century, which we saw at Vestavanen, uh, can be observed at two more of the most well-detected settlements in the region. And right to the north uh, of the area of my survey, uh, another metal rich site, uh, site um, is moved across a river at about the same time. And if, uh, if we look at the overall, uh, uh, the little bits and pieces of different settlements excavated across the region, the pattern is equally striking. Only in three, perhaps uh, four cases out of 110 of the settlements narrowly dated within the 5th to the 11th century, they seem to remain at the same location during the first half of the 7th century. So to, to round things off, the Viking Age towns of northern Jutland did not pop out of nowhere. They grew out of a region densely populated for centuries prior to the first urban developments. Already by the 5th century, most of the last settlements in the densely populated coastal zone were probably run by local magnates. In the first half of the 7th century, a large part of the settlements in the region were restructured, and during the following centuries, several sites show various signs of specialization. And the extent and character of the changes at some of these restructured settlements suggest that the process was initiated because of external pressure. Taxation of basic agrarian production is most likely the explanation. At least that's what, that's what I believe. This suggests rather well-developed structures of power. On the other hand, the restructured settlements were not drained of wealth. The metal detector finds seem to reflect a high level of economic activity and also the existence of elite environments at most of the sites throughout the rest of the millennium. Thus, uh, the taxes that followed this restructuring must have been somewhat more modest than the taxes paid to the church and the king during the Middle Ages in the following centuries. All this raises uh, a number of interesting questions, one of which is of course related to the initiative. Who initiated this restructuring? Was it local magnets or was it a super regional power? At present, uh, there's no clear answer to that, but it's of course tempting to point at the leaders of the settlements that were apparently not affected by the process. The few that were never moved during this formative period. Thank you.